Hey everyone, I'm Nikki Young and this is Serial Napper, an international true crime podcast. Do you believe in psychics? If not, tonight's story may just change your mind. Whether you believe psychics are real or fake, their abilities are sometimes used by police agencies to help shed some light on the difficult cases they might be working on. Sometimes the police feel like they've helped, and sometimes they can turn out to be completely wrong, maybe even scam-like. This is the story of one psychic by the name of Etta Smith who helped police to locate the body of Melanie Uribe. Was it her psychic abilities that assisted her, or was she more involved than anyone knew? Let's talk about it. Our sponsor for tonight's episode is O'Brien Garage Doors. They're a family-owned and operated garage door company that provides residential garage door services, including repair, sales, installation, and more. Keeping your garage door in proper repair is actually a very vital part of keeping yourself safe. So listen up. Their technicians are certified and trained to take care of all of your garage door needs so that you can rest easy. Whether your garage needs service or, hey, maybe you just need a new one, they're happy to help. And it's only $49.50 to get it checked out and tuned up at O'BrienDoor.com. Or you can search for them on Google by typing in O'Brien Garage Doors near me. You can also schedule your service right on their website. So stop delaying those repairs, get it done, and relax knowing that your garage door is doing its job. That's O'BrienDoor.com. Now, our victim in tonight's story was 31-year-old Melanie Uribe, who was born on September 9th, 1948. Melanie was a divorced single mother of an 8-year-old son who worked as a nurse at Pacoima Hospital in Burbank, California. On December 15th, 1980, Melanie would go missing on her way into work the night shift. When she failed to show up, the hospital called her house phone, but no one answered. After not showing up at any point throughout the shift, her employer decided to call the police, which I thought was pretty dang good of them. I feel like if I failed to show up for work, everyone would just assume I decided to stay in bed and didn't bother to call in. But Melanie, she was known to be very reliable and punctual. So not showing up for a shift, especially when she has a job as important as being a nurse, it just was not normal for her. So police went to her apartment where they talked to her roommate, who also said that she had not seen her since she left for work earlier. The roommate described Melanie to police as being about 5 foot 2 inches tall, blonde, and wearing a white uniform, leather jacket, and brown sweater when she left their apartment to go to work. The next morning on December 16, 1980, police found Melanie's truck with her nurse's uniform in it, but there was no sign of Melanie. The truck had been set on fire, possibly to hide evidence. Initially, police weren't sure if Melanie was dead or alive, but they searched the area and they found no trace of her. So they put out a media alert on TV and the radio, and it wasn't long before they received calls from witnesses who say they heard a woman screaming and then they watched as two men forced their way into the woman's truck and drove away. The following day, on December 16th, 32-year-old Lockheed aerospace worker named Etta Smith was listening to a newscast on her radio at work when they began talking about the disappearance of Melanie and how they had found her truck on a dead-end street, but they were still looking for her. She heard how police had begun searching the area, including the houses nearby, and she heard a voice in her head say, she's not in a house. As soon as she had that thought, She had this clear visual in her head of where Melanie was. In her vision, she saw a canyon and a curving road, shrubbery, hills in the backdrop, and a dirt path leading to something white. She didn't know the name of the location or anything like that, but she had a very clear vision. It was almost like a movie scene in her head. Now, Etta, she's never claimed to be a psychic. This was something new to her. So she just starts arguing with herself over what she's going to do about this vision. She doesn't want to come off as crazy, but what she has just seen in her head was so clear. And she just has this pulling, like she just can't live with herself if she doesn't tell the police what she saw. 
In the end, Etta decides to leave work a little early and go right to the police station to tell the authorities about her vision. At this point, she didn't really care if they thought that she was nuts. She just needed to tell someone. So off to the police station she goes and she talks to the detective at the front and tells him that she had a vision about where the missing person was. She describes the location in great detail, and the officer knew of where she was referring to. Together, he and Etta, they were able to pinpoint the spot on a map, which was a remote part of the San Fernando Valley, Lopez Canyon, above Lakeview Terrace. As it turns out, police hadn't searched that area yet, but the detective in charge assured Etta that they would. Of course, They were really skeptical of this seemingly random woman walking into the station talking about this vision that she had, but Etta was a businesswoman with top security clearance. She was someone with credibility and a reputation. So police took down her information and the officer instructed her to be back at the station the following morning at 7 a.m. and they would have a helicopter from the air support division there to take them up into this area and search. Even though the officer said that they would have a look, Etta felt like she just had to go see the location for herself just to ensure that it had been checked. About this sort of pulling feeling that Etta had, she would go on to say, Something inside of me said they might not check in time. I didn't know if the victim was dead or alive. I just felt so strongly that she was there that if somebody needed to go get her, they needed to get her right away. And I couldn't let it rest because it wouldn't leave me alone. I kept seeing it over and over and over again. So I proceeded to go to the canyon. Etta had no idea if there was going to be anything there at all or if there was a person or if she was just losing it. So without really thinking it all through... She went home, she picked up her kids first because she was already running late, arriving from work. Her kids were 9 or 10 years old at the time. She loaded them into the car along with her 20-year-old niece and drove to the spot on the map, the one from her vision. Now, as she got closer to the location, Etta says she began to once again feel Melanie's presence, confirming to her that she was somewhere in this canyon, she was on the right path. Etta spots a fresh set of car tracks, and instinctively, something told her to stop the car. So she gets out of her car and goes to take a closer look at the set of tracks. She puts her fingers right into the impressions in the dirt, and as soon as her fingers touched the dirt, she would say it was almost electrifying. She could just feel all kinds of trauma, assumingly coming from Melanie, giving her a sign that she was on the right track. So she got back in her car and she followed the tracks as she felt something pulling her in that direction. That's when Etta's daughter said she spotted something in the bush. And as they got closer to this bush, Etta could see that it was in fact a body. And all that she could really make out was the white nursing shoes sticking out of the bush. She knew it had to be Melanie. And as she looked around the location, everything was exactly as it had been in her vision. She called police, who arrived on scene quite quickly. The body was taken away, and an autopsy determined that it was indeed Melanie Uribe. She had been robbed, raped, and beaten to death. She was stripped naked and left there in that brush, just like Etta had seen. However, Melanie's killers, they remained at large. Police didn't have anyone in custody yet, And the only real lead that they had to go on at this point was the witness who said they saw those two men jump in Melanie's truck. But how did Etta know where Melanie's body would be? Her description was just too accurate. And then for her to go actually find the body before police. There hadn't been anything in the newspapers indicating any clues that the police had or any suspects that they might be looking for. And basically the case was going absolutely nowhere at that point. Now, all of a sudden, she's found out in this deserted area by this woman who claimed to know that she was there. So, all of the suspicion fell to Etta. That evening, they called Etta into the police station. They had so many questions for her. Hey 
Hey listeners, when's the last time you've had your garage looked at? Do you even know that it's working properly? Or have you been putting off those repairs for as long as you can remember? Keeping your garage door in proper working order is a key part of keeping yourself safe. So listen up. O'Brien Garage Doors is a family-owned and operated garage door company that provides residential garage door services, including repairs, sales, installations, and more. They've been doing this for 30 years, so you know you're in good hands. Their technicians are certified and trained to take care of all of your garage door needs so that you can rest easy. Whether your garage door needs servicing or maybe you need a brand new one altogether, they're happy to help. And it's only $49.50 to get it checked out and tuned up. Just go to O'BrienDoor.com or you can search for them on Google. Google O'Brien Garage Doors Near Me. I also have their link in my show notes, so make sure you go check them out. Now back to our story. Here's what Etta had to say about the two detectives that sat down with her at the station. They wanted me to explain to them how the whole thing had unfolded, and that seemed very normal to me, but after I felt I had finished telling them everything and filled in the blanks, it's like, okay, let's start at the beginning. Tell us this again. So we go through the story again and again and again. This went on for hours until about 10 o'clock that evening when it becomes very obvious to me that now I'm a suspect. And it's true. Police were focusing on Etta as a suspect. To them, she seemed to know too much about the crime to not be involved. Even if she wasn't the one who physically killed Melanie, they believed that she could be an accessory either before or after the fact. So Etta was interrogated at the police station for 10 hours straight. She couldn't really explain to them how or why she had this vision, but she did deny having any involvement throughout the entire interview. Then police asked Etta to take two polygraph exams, both of which she passed. But the thing with polygraphs is they aren't 100% accurate. So to me, it almost seems pointless to even give them out. Obviously, if someone fails the test, police tend to focus in on that person. However, if a person passes the test, they still might not be ruled out as a suspect. And that's exactly what happened in Etta's case. The detectives believed that she was trying to deceive the polygraph by attempting to hold her breath. And so they even went as far as to tell Etta that she failed the test, you know, to see if they could get her to crack and tell them what they wanted to hear. And what they wanted to hear was something concrete to show how she knew Melanie's body was at the canyon. When she didn't break or crack or provide what they wanted, they booked her as an accessory to murder and she was locked up for four days. Now remember, Etta is a mom of two and she's a respectable member of her community. She's got a great job. So being in jail for four days would have been grueling and embarrassing. But lucky for her all was about to be revealed. A police informant came forward and said that he had heard one of the killers bragging about the murder in his neighborhood, talking about he and his friends were the real murderers and how they were going to be getting away with it. So this guy was arrested and he quickly turned on his co-conspirators. The real killers were a 17-year-old who has not been identified due to his age, Spencer Nelson, 21 years old, and Louis Carnell Morgan, 20. Just like the witness had described, these three men jumped into Melanie's truck while she was at a stoplight and made her drive to the canyon about 15 miles away. Then they robbed her, they raped her, and they beat her to death with a rock. She died a horrible death due to blunt force trauma. Now that they had this full confession, Etta Smith was released from jail on December 21st. Police had determined that she had no connection to the perpetrators or the murder, even though they couldn't really rationally explain how she had known what she knew. Now, as for Etta, she's always maintained that She's not really a psychic and she has no explanation of why or how this onset of psychic abilities came to be. 
She would go on to say, I sometimes wonder what it was that transpired from this innocent person who was murdered and how her death somehow reached out and touched me. I think it's one of the mysteries in life that many things happen to us throughout our life that are unexplainable. Etta would go on to file a wrongful arrest suit against the police department. She felt like her reputation had been dragged through the mud and she just wanted to finally clear her name. She was asking $750,000 in damages. One narrative that kept coming up during the trial was that Etta just wanted to be famous, that maybe she had overheard one of the killers talking about it, and so she made up this elaborate story about having this vision. Repeatedly during the trial, she denied having any desire to become famous because of finding the body. But an undercover woman police officer who was put into a jail cell with Etta said that sometimes she talked about writing a book and making a movie from her experience. Etta refuted this and testified that she made some reference to the whole situation being so strange that it sounded like a movie, but that she never wanted to be famous. In the end, the jury awarded her $24,000, and Etta would say that although she describes herself as a very sensitive person, she's still not psychic. She says she's never had another vision like that. Although, if she did, do you really think she'd report it after having to go to jail? I couldn't find any other information or updates about Etta, but it doesn't appear that she ever went on to try to, I don't know, use her abilities for profit, which to me adds some more credibility to her story. This all happened forever ago, and I think some of the attitudes in the police force of using psychics have changed. Not entirely, of course, but I think cases and stories like this kind of opened the doors and paved the way for police to start utilizing psychics in their cases. I found a really cool article on the CIA website that talks about police agencies utilizing psychics in their cases, and I'm going to link it in my show notes. Go have a look when you have some time. It's super interesting. I will read you a little bit from it, though. There's a section titled How They Work, and it says... Each psychic has her own particular method. The following examples are situations that you might encounter. As previously mentioned, initial contact will probably be by telephone. The psychic will ask for some information about the case. You need not go into great detail. If the psychic asks for feedback to determine if she is picking up relevant impressions, a simple response is best. In some cases, the investigator and psychic will never meet personally. All conversations will be conducted by telephone. In other cases, the psychic may wish to visit the crime scene or drive around the crime area. A psychic might ask to see a picture of the victim or touch an article of the victim's clothes. The investigator must be careful to protect any item that might be introduced as evidence in court. The talent of the psychics vary. Some will provide exact names and locations. More often, the information will be general in nature. Here are two examples. Description of suspect. I see a blonde-headed man, a singer. I believe he is associated with a nightclub in this area, which was burglarized in the past three months. Here's a description of a location. There's a lot of tall grass near the body. It is in a field with cattle nearby. Off to my right is a building with the initials PS painted on the wall. And then it goes on to say, both clues require further investigation. Individual words might need interpretation. The following examples are taken from actual cases. The psychic says, I see a windmill. The interpretation, a sign near the body stated windmill estates. The psychic says, the words two guys are important. The interpretation, the two guys department store was associated with the case. And says the investigator must be aware from what viewpoint the psychic is speaking. The psychic might be describing the crime scene from the victim's viewpoint, then switch to the criminal's viewpoint. It must be re emphasized that the psychic does not replace the sound investigative techniques, but functions as an investigative tool. Courts do not recognize psychic testimony. Cases solved with the assistance of a psychic must be reconstructed using established police procedures before presentation in court. Seriously, how cool is the CIA? I was like, <laughs> that is just the neatest thing. 
Or maybe you believe the whole thing is hogwash. Either way, I'd love to hear what you think. Did Etta Smith really have a psychic vision? Or did she just get lucky in finding the body? I mean, that one doesn't really seem very likely. Maybe you think she overheard one of the killers talking about where they put the body. They were talking about actually killing the woman. I don't know why the hell they would ever bring up where they put the body, but um, I'll leave that up to you. What do you think? Can psychics help a police investigation or do you think they're a waste of time and resources? I'd love to hear what you think. Make sure you reach out and let me know. I would once again like to thank tonight's sponsor. Make sure you schedule your servicing today at obriandoor.com slash schedule. I also have their links in my show notes, so make sure you go follow them on social media. As for me, if you want to reach out, you can find me on Facebook at Serial Napper. You can also search for me on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Check me out on Twitter at Serial underscore Napper or I'm on YouTube, Nikki Young, Serial Napper, all one word. And if you're watching on YouTube, I would love if you could give me a thumbs up and subscribe. If you'd like to become a patron and unlock some badass bonuses like ad-free exclusive episodes, merch discounts, and other cool benefits, visit patron.podbean.com slash Serial Napper. Until next time, don't be a Dahmer. Bye.